Chapter 2 Life in the Coal Region Speedy Butello, Jake Pupko, and I were struggling up the cinder bank that spilled out of the abandoned Sayer shaft on the north side of town. The company burned coal to heat the mine in winter and dumped the residue outside the coal hole. Over the years, the pile grew to about 300 yards high, and getting up it was like climbing through sand. Making it harder that day in 1944 were the five gallons of gasoline we were carrying after a fourth friend had lifted them from another mining operation. We did not want the gas to go to waste and had a plan to put it to good use. Finally, we made it to the top of the plateau. Going down was a lot easier and more fun than coming up because you could take a running start and jump off the bank and the loose cinders cushioned your landing. We had other things in mind that day, however. Scrounging around, we found some old tin cans, filled them with the gas, and doused the entrance to the mine. The hole was about six feet by six feet, and we splashed the gas all around for a good fifteen feet inside. We saved a little and poured an igniter trail to the outside. We did the math and figured that fifteen feet outside the hole was far enough to be safe. I lit a match and held it to the trail. No dice. It didn't catch. We moved a little farther in and Speedy tried with another match. No luck. Two steps closer, we tried again. Damn, nothing. The stupid trail of gasoline would not light. Now we were about three feet from the entrance. Jake was suddenly overcome by bravado. Screw this, he said, and grabbed the entire book of matches lit it, and chucked it into the hole. Kaboom! It was like somebody flipped the switch on a 747. It blew out with such force that it burned off our eyebrows and singed our hair. We smelled like chickens that had been plucked with a blowtorch, and were certain we had passed through the gates of hell. Not only that, but the blast ignited the cinders, and the mountain caught fire. We spent the rest of the afternoon stomping, beating branches, and throwing dirt on the flames, anything we could do to get that fire out. We were eight years old at the time. Mount Carmel, where I was born in 1936, is a small mining town in northeast Pennsylvania. You pronounce it with the accent on car. Carmel. State Route 61 runs through the center of town. The whole place is about one mile square, with streets laid out in checkerboard fashion. When I was growing up, Mount Carmel had more than 17,000 people, but has shrunk to only a third of that today. I am reminded of something David said in the early 1980s when we were driving through town to a reunion of his mother's extended family. He turned to me and remarked, You know, I wouldn't want to live in Mount Carmel. Why? I asked. You couldn't affect the world very much from here. This was before he had risen very high in the organization, and I suppose it was a harbinger while also an accurate assessment of Mount Carmel's place in the world. The day of my birth, January 19th, my dad tried to drive my mother to the hospital, but his car got stuck in the snow, so he took her back inside the house. He called our family doctor, Dr. Allen, and he came down. But his car got stuck in the snow, too, so I was born at home. I lived in Mount Carmel until I was 17, and despite David's assessment many years later, I have to say it was a great place to grow up. In the 1930s and 1940s, the prevailing attitude to just about everything was laissez-faire. So long as you did not break the law too much, you were okay. You could bend it quite a bit, though, I have carried that attitude with me my whole life, and I'm certain my children absorbed some of it. People were hard workers, and most worked in the coal mines. The town was like a little Europe. My family was Polish, but there were also Slovaks, Italians, Irish, Germans, and others. Truly a great potpourri of humanity. Football was king. People lived and died by the fortunes of the high school team, if you were on the Mount Carmel football team, you could do no wrong. You could be caught robbing a store, 
and the cop would scold the store owner for reporting you. Criminals who didn't play football, however, did not have it so good. The cops were tough on anybody messing with the hard-working people of Mount Carmel. On Friday nights in the fall, the band and cheerleaders marched down 3rd Street from the high school to the stadium, and the town turned out to cheer them on and follow in behind. After the game, people would head to Matucci's, a bar and restaurant, to relive the game with drinking buddies. Great times. We were too poor to afford an actual football, so we stuffed rags into a sock, tied off the end, and presto, we had a makeshift football. We kids played touch under the corner streetlights and relived the glories of the evening in our own way until our mothers called for us to come home. Most of the homes in Mount Carmel were row houses, small but cozy and comfortable in a way. People did not know any other way to live. They were born into it, and that was life. When people died, the funeral director came and the casket was laid out in the parlor, so friends and relations could come to pay their last respects. Back then, a miner could buy one of those houses for $2,000 or $3,000. A miner made around 50 bucks a week and could raise his family on that. During summers, I sometimes made pocket money by picking huckleberries and selling them door to door for 35 cents a quart. One summer, my childhood friend Joe Sirisky stole a case of dynamite, 10 gallons of gasoline, blasting caps and fuse from a bootleg coal hole. When the big companies felt that a mine was played out and no longer financially worthwhile, they would simply abandon it. Then a couple of enterprising guys would come in and continue to work the hole, and they could make a decent living that way. One of these abandoned mine shafts was where Joe got the dynamite. Some other kids and I spent that summer blowing stuff up in the woods. My mother, had she known what I was up to, would have said, Now, Ronnie, don't get hurt. But she probably wouldn't have stopped me. There was a saloon across the street from our house. Another to the left and a third in back. Three saloons just in sight of our house. I slept on the top floor, and in summer I could hear miners going down the street and bickering about something of no consequence. During summer it was so hot it was unbearable, and I had the windows wide open. One evening my friend Eugene Stabinsky's father and another miner were going at it. The whole Stubinsky family had a habit of giving people lip and thinking they could get away with it. It wasn't working this time, though. God damn you, I heard one miner yelling, and then Stubinsky's father pleading, Look, I'm a married man with three kids, followed by whap, 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 and then silence. Force overcoming reason. Then a few moments later, Hey, buddy, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. Come on, I'll buy you a beer and they went back inside and kept drinking. Nearly every block in town had a saloon, but there were nearly as many churches. The Irish had a church, so did the Slovaks and the Italians. The Polish had two churches. Two factions of Poles had been unable to settle an argument, so rather than have to look at one another on Sundays, they built separate churches. One really great thing about the diversity in town was the fantastic variety of ethnic foods. For block parties, the women would get together and take pride in cooking up their national dishes for everyone to enjoy. I can still taste the homemade pierogies, babkas, a pie made from potatoes, soprasata, a dry Italian salami, lasagna, homemade donuts, and my all-time favorite, pizzelles. These are light Anna's flavored wafers that I learned to bake, and still do to this day. Taste one and you are hooked. Next to football, the other thing that people in Mount Carmel respected was music. If a miner saw a kid who played an instrument being picked on, he'd say, Hey, lay off the kid, he's a musician. My father, Anthony, was a musician. He could play piano, accordion, saxophone, and clarinet. He had a band that used to rehearse in our living room, and I would lie there in my go carriage, that's what we called a baby stroller in those days, and listen to the music. When I was 11, I told my dad I wanted to start playing an instrument. What do you want to play? He asked me. I don't know, a trumpet, I guess, I replied. 
and that was how I started. Music just sort of came to me. The first time I picked up a trumpet, I got a pretty decent tone out of it. If I heard a song once or twice, I could play it. I knew all the standards of the day, and by the time I was 13, I was playing gigs. One time, Tommy Butkiewicz and I went into the bar across the street from his house. Tommy played piano, and I played my trumpet. Afterward, we went around, and the miners gave us a dime or a quarter apiece, which doesn't sound like much until you realize that you could buy a new pair of jeans at pennies for a dollar fifty in the mid-1940s. Nobody kicked us out or said anything, and that was my first gig. My dad had an insurance brokerage, and in a back room he set up a little instrument repair shop. Students from the high school would bring in their instruments, mainly woodwinds, and he would fix them up. He always lost money on the deal, but did it because he was a good-hearted guy. Maybe it was because his own life had been rough. He was born in 1899. He was six years old when his father died. So my dad had to go to work in the mines to help his mother. In those days, kids would lead the mules into the mine or help sort the coal from the rocks. He tried a lot of different things to make money and eventually settled on selling insurance. Before that, he had a soda company that went bust because people didn't return the bottles. Another time, he had a gas station, and in the basement of our house, he put in a big tank that held the gasoline. It was a half cellar that had windows, and you could see in from the outside. One day, a neighbor came over and said to my mother, Helen, I don't mean to tell you your business, but your son Tony took off the gas cap and lit a match to see how much was left in the tank. There's the old saying, if your time is up, your time is up. Nobody on the block's time was up that day. That was life in the coal region. The values I grew up with and what I wanted to instill in my own children. For three of the four, I think it has worked out pretty well. When I graduated from high school, my father said, If you go to college, study business. But I didn't want to study business. If anything, I wanted to study music. I'd had a job playing at a country club six nights a week, but I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. In other words, I was ripe for the picking by the first person with a good pitch.